When was God at his best? When did the great God reach the height of his greatness? It is obvious that we would say Genesis 1 and 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And when one considers the heavens and the earth and realizes that it all came into being by the command of God, you'd have to say that God was at his best when he created the heavens and the earth. Think of the heavens. I think it's Abraham Lincoln says that he could well understand a man looking down on the earth not believing but he can't understand anyone who looks into the heavens and don't believe. The heavens, the heavens, worlds without ends, the heavens, stars undiscovered, the heavens, the planets, the sky, flying at 40,000 feet in the sky and looking out across the vastness of the heaven and looking upwards and there is more and more and more and traveling by light distance for thousands of years you never arrive at the end of the heavens because at the end of the heavens the heavens keep coming at you and so God had to be at his best when he made the heavens and then when one looks at the earth the earth in all of its beauty and its resources and how it's so magnificently put together and how it comes forth in such a perfect order how 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 the winters come and how the the spring comes and how the summer comes and how the fall comes and how the beauty of the earth even now as he has fixed it where every now and then as mama says he groans in his spirit and we call it an earthquake it's at his best even in earthquakes in california and then you leave california and you come through that picturesque part of the world called arizona new mexico and that wonderland of west texas are uh, jump up to the pikes peak and all of the other tall mountains as seen are uh, as uh, uh, typified in Colorado and all the swamplands of Louisiana and to the beauty of Florida and all up the coast coming on up towards Chicago and leaping over into New Jersey that that after you leave Newark and Jersey City that beautiful uh, homeland and then go on up into the picturesque parts of New England past my daughter's home in Connecticut and go on up as far as you want to go even to Banga Banga you've got to say that he was at his best when he made the earth and though we don't believe it leave the United States and there's some beauty even when you leave here now it's hard to find but it's out there the Alps and all of the picturesque places of the world in Africa and the third world God had to be at his best when he made the heavens and the earth no no me think not me think God was at his best not in Genesis 1 1 but in Genesis 1 27 when it said and God made man and woman I'm impressed with the earth I'm impressed with the heavens but there is nothing made so uniquely as man himself 
and I don't believe it, he, was, he was made like unto James Weldon's Johnson's poem and God was lonely. That's not language describing our God. Why would God be lonely when all of the heavens glorify him daily and the angels bow down and say holy, holy all the time, holy. I remember as a uh, student preacher, I asked one of my mentors, Dr. McCardell, uh, why, uh, why the angels bow and say holy and then come up again and bow and say holy? I said, don't they get tired? And McCardell said, no, for two reasons. Number one, they don't have earthly bodies. They have heavenly bodies and they don't get tired. And that's something to look forward to when we all get to heaven. And he said the second thing is they're not bowing out of duty. They are bowing, reacting to something God has done. And they bow, they see something and they bow and pay homage to him by saying holy. And by the time they get their head back up and look at him again, he has done something else. And they bow again and say holy. And by the time they get their head back up, he's such a great God, he has revealed something else to them. And they say, holy! He is a great God. And that ain't hard to understand because even as human beings, he does something different all the time. He woke me up this morning. Holy! He let me dress myself. Holy! He let me get here without getting hit. Holy! And even when I go to bed tonight, there'll be something he'll do. Just before I close my eyes, I'll say, Holy, Lord God Almighty. So he wasn't lonely. And then James Weldon Johnson said, he sat down beside the banks of a river and he thought and thought and thought. He didn't do that. Where would God, where would a thought come from to God? God is the creator of thoughts. Whoever could send God a thought is God. So he didn't think it and try to figure it out. He just made man, already thought out, already planned out before the foundation of the earth, of the world. He just revealed it and said, let it be so. And look at man, man with the ability to love and to be loved, man with compassion and thought, man with excellence and drive, man able to reach the moon at a single bound, man who controls and moves and motivates one another and builds great cities and God made man. And God made man. And me think that that was God at his best. No. No. I think not. Some would say that the deliverance of Israel, that long journey both into Egypt and out of Egypt and on down to the promised land, pictures God at his best. God saying to Moses out of a burning bush to get up and go down and confront Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. And God causing a stick to turn into a snake and God causing frogs to sleep at night in the bed of Pharaoh and, and, and God causing lice to be more plentiful than there are grains of sand in Egypt. That was God at his best. And God warning Pharaoh over and over, let my people go. And Pharaoh refusing and God causing a death angel to ride through at night and kill all of the firstborn. That was God at his best. And those several million people loaded up and marching out of Egypt and being stopped at the Red Sea and God flip-flopping the sun to slow down the march of the enemy. God telling water to congeal and move back and ground to be dry and marched an army of people across and then let it flop and Pharaoh's army got trapped. He had to be at his best. He had to be at his best when he heard them say, we are thirsty and water came forth out of a dry rock. When he heard them say we are hungry and manna came from heaven's kitchen, he had to be at his best. And when they complained that we need more than bread and when he cooked quail and hip and floated them down on clouds, 
He had to be at his best. When serpents started biting in the wilderness, and instead of penicillin and instead of other medicine, he just made another serpent out of brass and raised it up on a pole and said, look and live. And as many who looked live, he had to be at his best. Confronting their enemies over and over again, and yet he marched them over them and across them and marched them 40 years in the wilderness without wearing out a piece of clothing. He had to be at his best. And then marched them on into the promised land by walking around the walls of Jericho. And at a shout, the walls came falling down. There can be no better display of the greatness of our God, says many, than the deliverance of Israel. Me think not. He was mighty good, but he wasn't at his best. And we rush to that passage of scripture that tells us when God was at his best. And that John 3:16. For God so loved the world that he gave not one of his sons, as the University of Chicago now says, but his only son. All the rest of us are children through adoption. And I'm glad I've been adopted into the very family of God, but he had only one begotten son, and he did what I could have never done. He looked at fallen man and agreed to give his son as a substitute for the whole. I have a son, and I know about the fallenness of man. But I could never give my son willingly for nobody. What it was, I don't know what it takes. But I can tell you now, I wouldn't do it. I don't have what God had. So he must have been at his best when he took a look at his only begotten son. When he took a look at the glory and the Shekinah of all heaven. When he took a look at one who knew no sin. When he took a look at one who had no faults. And not for Billy Graham, not for uh, his mother, not for some outstanding citizen. But the whole life was Skid Row. Sin was the greatest disease. And for Skid Row, he gave his only begotten son. The glory and the Shekinah of all heaven. That had to be the great moment in the history of God dying for me how can it be we just sang it that my God thou shouldst die for me no 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 he hadn't reached his greatest yet he still got more he can do he hadn't reached his greatest yet he still got more he can do that we have not seen yet let's such a little father let's such a little father let's look at what he did in Christ for God was in Christ let's such a little father Let's watch him, let's watch him, let's even watch his birth. Never a one born like him. Holy Lord God Almighty. Born in a stable and laid in a manger. I wouldn't have come that way. Born in a stable and laid in a manger. If I were God, my God, you all would know who I was. <laughs> By my God, I would have a golden stairwell from earth to glory. And I'd have angels on every tear singing holy, holy, holy. And I'd have trumpets blasting like this on every stairwell. <laughs> and yet he slipped in here in the womb of a virgin and laid in a manger. Lord God Almighty. And P.S. Wilkerson says, and y'all lay it on him. But Dr. P.S. Wilkerson, one of the great preachers of Texas, who's now in glory, says that when the angels sang, it was a rebellion in heaven. Lord God Almighty, he said, because they couldn't take it. Even the idea of Christ leaving glory, leaving heaven, upset them. But then when they saw the preciousness of heaven slipping into the womb of a woman, gestating for nine months, and coming out saying yes ma'am and no ma'am 
And when they saw men lay him in a manger and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, what we heard was a rebellion. Say, holy, say, holy. On earth wasn't saying nothing. The angels broke loose and said, glory to God in the highest. Holy, Lord God Almighty. Look at him, look at him, look at him, not only in his birth, but look at him in his life. Look at him, look at him. Never a man lived like him. Look at him in his miracles. Look at him changing water to wine at a blush. Look at him being baptized in Jordan. And the Trinity gathers together on earth for the first time since earth was created. Holy Spirit in the form of a dove, Jesus in the water, and the voice of God speaking, this is my son. Look at him in his miracles as he feeds the 5,000, as he walks up to a funeral procession and stops it and returns the dead back to the house from whence it came. Watch him and look at him. Look at him as he multiplies fish and loaves and feeds 5,000. Look at him as he spit upon eyes and the blind see and the lame walk. Jesus is earthly life was God at his best. Me think not. He was mighty good. But he wasn't at his best. And so we go to Calvary. I said we go to Calvary. The preacher hadn't preached until he goes to Calvary. Y'all are preaching on financial plans and economic development but you better take them to Calvary because it was out there on Calvary that the Son of God God said here are the sins of the unborn Here are the sins of the living. Here are the sins of the unborn. And when he got them all on him, he cried out, My God, my God! It was that that we saw the S-U-N go out because the S-O-N was dying. It was there that your sins and my sins, not in part, but the whole, were paid. That had to be that moment, that day, that time when Jesus dropped his head and died. It had to be God at his best. For what could be more than him dying on the cross? No, we have to push further because we have had tracks to lead into the graveyard before. Abraham's tracks leads into the graveyard. Mama's tracks leads into the graveyard. We have to have something better than that. We've got to have somebody whose tracks are on the other side of the grave. We see God at his best. No. We have to go further. Because all of this thus far is too great for me. I can't fathom it. It's too high. I cannot conceive of it. I believe it. 
but it's too great for me to understand. He'll have to explain all of this. How one could substitute for the whole. Let's go to John over there in that 21st chapter and 15th verse and see if we can find him at his best. And guess what he's doing? He's talking to Peter, cussing, denying Peter after the resurrection. And because I'm human in my thought, I know what he's doing. He is really laying Peter out. Because I'm human in my evaluation, he's sending Peter to hell. Because Peter messed up. He not only denied, but he emphatically denied with a swearing word. And this holy Christ in my mind, who has now conquered both death, hell, and the grave, is now risen. And he is really letting Peter have it. Because Peter messed up. And he is really letting Peter have it. So let's, let's just slip in on and hear him sentence Peter to hell. And yet I hear him say, Lovest thou me, Peter? God extending grace and mercy to somebody worse than me. That's him at his best. Creating the heavens and the earth, that's outstanding, but I can't relate to that. Creating all that there is, that's great, I can't relate to it. Opening the Red Seas, that's good, I can't relate to it. But when I hear him talking to another backslider, restoring him to the faith and the grace, I can relate to that. I see hope in that. And so God was at his best when he talked to Peter. No. As a matter of fact, to be very frank with you, when God was at his best, ain't even in the Bible. Not even in the Bible. God was at his best one Thursday morning. And it wasn't even in Jerusalem. It was in Sweet Home, 14 miles out from Seguin, 39 miles out from San Antonio, Texas, when a little boy, 11 years old, fell down in the middle of a country road and said, Save me, Lord Jesus. And this great big God came all the way to Sweet Home and got in the heart of a poor, wretched little boy and saved him. And now safe am I. That's when God was at his best. <laughs> to me, it was Texas. Where was it to you? Where was it to you? Where did he hear you cry? Where did he save your soul? Where did heaven come down and glory shine all around? And the great thing about it is he's repeating it every day, every morning. He's not making another sun, but he's saving another sinner. He's not making another earth, but he's saving another backslider. That's God at his best. At his best. Saving. Delivering. God. At his best. It took a miracle to put the stars in place. It took a miracle to hang the sun in space. But when he saved my soul, cleansed and made me whole, that was the miracle of love and grace. 